Are you ready for this? Uh-huh. Hello, everybody. You're all looking Indeed. fabulous tonight, as always. I'll let a few more Hi. people get in the room. It's so good to see so many of you here tonight. I've got it. I'll just jump in. Um, those of you that know me or were around at the time might know that I had a training set, a uh, coaching session with Hillary, and I basically was like, shot out from a rocket for like the next week. I'm going to do amazing things. My career is going to be on fire. I love everyone. Hillary Huber is the rock star. She's amazing. You've got to go to Hillary. Literally, I wouldn't shut up. I mean, people were at the point they were going to pay Boring. me to shut up. Yeah. Sorry, all your friends. <laughs> and But the thing is, I if I really like a coach, I know. And the first thing I loved about Hillary, the first thing she said on the session was, right, I'm not going to waste any of your time blowing smoke up your ass. I'm going to tell you what you need to know. And she literally was, gave me actions that I could, tangible things that I could do immediately after the call to address the actual questions I asked. And I'm a very action-oriented person, and that was exactly what I needed to hear. I, I'm not like a person that needs someone to give me confidence. I've got confidence, whatever. Just tell me what I can do to fix this, this, and this. And Hillary delivered in spades. So before this call, I asked a few people, so what comes to mind when you think of Hillary? Everyone kept saying, cool. She's so cool. She's so cool. I mean, the word cool came up more than in connection with anyone I've ever met. The other one was that she's always gives you actions. She always gives you something to do. Hmm. You feel like when Hillary tells you something, you're in safe hands. You trust, and, it's, and especially well, the, the gym with the earphones. Oh my God. Game changer. That's a good one. You, right yeah, it was amazing. So I have some questions for Hillary myself, um, and I'm really anxious to dive in. You have been interviewed a lot, Hillary, so I'd like to like give you a chance to kind of introduce yourself. The thing is, is everyone knows you. Everyone's heard your interviews. We all know that you've done amazing books, and the, you know, the caliber of the books, and kind of that you've, and I suspect having listened to the podcast, that part of why you're so cool is your <laughs> upbringing, is the Hawaii surfer girl and then New York and moving around and everything. And so that draws me to my first question. I might as well just dive in. Okay. With the audiobook industry growing so fast and all the new people joining in the last year and everyone, we're, it's natural we're using our creative minds to get out of the boxes that the world's kind of in because of the situation. So everyone's coming up with new social networking things and social groups and, and you, I know you went to the Audis and APAC and you won all these awards and everything. And I'm wondering how much of being a cool girl, what do you think of the social? I'd love, to, I'd love to hear what your perception of it is and how you address it and how you jump into it and if you think it's changed. Okay. Um, first of all, hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. It's, um, it's super fun to see all of your faces. I've seen lots of your names before and some of your faces, but um, it's just, uh, it's, I just love any, I love the gathering. So thank you for showing up. Um, uh, and, and I think that that is really the root of, of who I am in general is I'm, I'm a super social animal. And so any opportunity to hang out with a group of people, um, I'll, I'm there, count me in, I wanna hang out, I wanna go to the party, I don't care if I don't know anybody. I, I always think, my, my husband hates going places where he doesn't know people, he, he's got a little shy gene in him. And, and I'm the one who's got this social um, construct in my career, he's a writer, he, he's all by himself. And so I'm so constantly dragging well. him to stuff and, um, and he hates it. 
And I just, all I think is, God, I would have been the best wife of some businessman or politician who got dragged to things all the time because I just want to meet people and I want to hear what you have going on. I want to know what your life is about. Um, I like to learn what people are doing, um, where they're from. And, and so uh, I guess whether, when you talk about, is it intimidating? Um, I think that, I think that in this, particular genre of performance, audiobooks, um, I've never met a, a more accessible group of people, actors particularly, in my life. Um, even, you know, you think about who's like the pinnacle of the pinnacle, Scott Brick, oh my God, he's our, our you know, top dog narrator. He's just a big nerd like the rest of us. He wants to talk to anybody. You see him at a party, you can march right up and go, hey, Scott, here's my name. I, I, you know, I'm really into Star Wars. He'll be like, dude, so am I, let's talk about it. So I just, I think that, um, I mean, I'm laughing when you keep saying you're so cool, you're so cool. I'm just a nerd who likes to talk to people. And I, and I put myself out there. I don't, I'm just kind of fearless in that way. So whether that translates to cool, I don't know if it's just confidence or, um, yeah, I just, I, I encourage you all to join anything you can. When we all get back together again and there are cocktail parties, go and talk to people. Everybody just, everybody, I think everybody feels the same. We're all a little like, oh, I'm a little shy. Can I go talk to, they don't know. I, I never think anybody knows who I am ever, ever. When anybody's like, oh my God, I know your name or I've, met, I've I'm like, really? I just, I just, that always kind of amazes me a little bit. Johnny Heller we were talking about the star quality, which I really feel it's safe to say that you have as well. And Sean Pratt and, and, you know, you've, ha you've worked hard, you've had a long career and you've worked hard to get to where you are. And Johnny said that he felt, I was asking him how he felt when people got all kind of like starstruck and like, like, it's like putting something between him, the person like, you know, he's the Johnny Heller. And I'm yeah. sure you must get some of that. Cause you say that, you're kind of surprised with it. Is it off-putting? Is it, was there a point in your career where you thought, hold on here, when you noticed a switch and you became the Hillary Huber? No, no, because I'm just me. Yeah. I'm not, I, that's why I hear things like that. And I'm like, oh, I don't really know what that <laughs> means. <laughs> I'm just out there struggling to do the best job I can to get the next book um, you know, to keep my career going and to try to connect to people as much as I can. So um, that's just, uh, that kind of talk makes me really uncomfortable, actually. And, and I'm kind um, of doing it. You know, it I, live in LA. I live in LA and I'm surrounded by ce celebs. We run yeah, into see, them all the time. They're in my yoga like class. That. They're, yeah, they're eating dinner next to us. And, and, um, and I'm, I'm always struck by this, like, they're just people too. And, yeah when can you interact with them as a person and when can I had dinner once with Helen Hunt and I went to a show with her because we had a mutual friend who was performing at the Hollywood Bowl. We had dinner with Helen Hunt and Hank Azaria and a group of other people. And I spent the whole night, four hours hanging out literally with her. This is at the height of Mad About You. And she had me go to the bathroom with her at the Hollywood Bowl because she was nervous and all night. And cut to like two weeks later, I saw her in my yoga class and I'd seen her there quite a bit. And I was like, you know, if, if that were just Daniela, who I'd had dinner with, and then I saw her two weeks later, and I'd go up and I'd say, hey, how you doing? Blah, blah, blah. So I'm like, just do it. And I went up to her. I was like, hey, you know, we, we met at the music thing, and how you doing? And she looked at me, and she said, nice to see you, and turned and walked away. <laughs> my whole theory of they just want to be treated like people <laughs> but i love this con but i love this conversation because i'd be honest i lived in la for too long and i got to be obnoxiously like good at not knowing who anyone was because i got so annoyed. i don't know i think I, yeah i think i know everybody so yeah. i think you're all my friends yeah, yeah but the thing is here now lately i hear a lot of starstruckness a lot of people are like you know how do you get to be like so-and-so, so-and-so? And so I love this conversation. I love saying the cool Hillary Huber. So what does cool mean to you? What does the star struck mean to you? Because I love that people are sitting here talking to Hillary. 
You know what yeah, I mean? No, She's I'm a just, human being. I brush my teeth like the rest of you. Yeah. Floss, try to floss. <laughs> I can't remember it's who it was said, oh my God, she's the Oprah of the audiobook world. Oh God, you're <laughs> killing me. But I love that because we never see ourselves the way other people see us, which brings me to my next question. You got into audiobooks, and tell me if I've got this wrong. You were in the voiceover world, and the thought mm-hmm. of people having the specter of ageism mm-hmm. hanging over their head and especially being female and aging. And I know that the audiobook world is different in a lot of ways, but I was surprised. A couple of times I've been surprised. I've had other narrators say to me, oh, I've had to do other things because it surprised me because I never even considered that age would be an issue because you know, you're an actor but, and you're not showing your face or your body. And then also the thing about male narrators being paid more for books, especially I think in the romance sector. And I'm wondering what your mm-hmm. opinion about that is in the audiobook world. Okay, so that's two things, ageism yeah. and pay disparity. Yeah. Um, so, so I think that more in the, I think that ageism is obviously prevalent in anything on camera, no doubt right. about that. And there has been pay disparity sexism pay disparity in on camera as we all know all those actresses who are fighting against that um um and and then also in in the commercial world because i mean i've sounded like this since i'm 18 years old but i've been with my agent for almost 30 years 20 25 years with the same agent so wow. you know i was in the lower end of the um of the demographic when i first started doing voiceover work and the demographic is what 25 to 40 is the you know kind of main target yeah. and and i did young stuff but i did a lot of i did older and and i just even though the the voice is the same your agent knows you and there's a certain at a certain point i, I would see these older women come into the agency at, with this just sort of like pall of desperation over their faces because they weren't getting the work like they used to and and there it was palpable it was really palpable and 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 i'd look at them and think jesus i can't i don't ever want to be like that that i I, that is it made me really sad and um and so that's when i started thinking of of a different avenue i could take anyway so as i started getting older I, they started giving me less and less copy. I wasn't getting the 25 year old anymore, even though I sounded the same, but there's just something in them knowing my age, knowing every now and then they'll toss me a bone. Now I'll get, you know, 30, 35 or something. Um, mostly because of, I'm snarky. So I can get away with kind of doing, you know, younger kind of crap like that. Um, but it's a, it's a real thing in, in the commercial world. The great thing about the audiobook world, obviously, is there are books for every age. So, you know, maybe there'll be a point where I'm only reading, um, you know, more older sort of oriented novels and stuff. But, um, but I just, I just don't think it's as prevalent. So, yeah, see, because uh, for I me, like can, it's much more equitable. In the back of my mind, I wonder if other people have a perception that age matters. Does that make it true? Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, you know, like no, the, totally. you were saying with the voiceover, they had a perception and they knew your age and it made it true. So I'm wondering if, I mean, I'm not doing like ingenue romances anyway. I want to do psycho killer thrillers. So, you know, that yeah. killer can be any age. <laughs> what comes first, the voice or the desire to do psycho killer thrillers? I don't yeah. know. So yeah, so I'm wondering, and so I think I think that's a very good point because it's the perception. It was your agent's perception. Yeah. So if you let that perception affect you in the audiobook world, then it becomes a then it becomes something to hold you back. I mean, I'm not gonna. Uh, I'll be brutally honest. I work to maintain a kind of youthful, um, forward face right. within this within this market no doubt about it i want to appear like i know what's going on that i am hip that i have my finger on the pulse you Um, are very and that 
Well, I just, I were, I mean, as far as my, I, I'm not personally, but as far as what I put out there, I work, I work at, at creating that kind of persona because I want to still do books that are in that, in that age range. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think perception, there is perception. If I all of a sudden, you know, didn't know how to work the internet and, um, yeah, and complained all the time that my dentures were, you know, I don't know. I'm just trying to think of a stereotypical old person. I think of those commercials where those commercials were, we're teaching you how not to become your parents. Um, and, and also I think like, cause don't you feel like, I guess you could give into it at any time because I remember spending years being told I wasn't old enough for things years. And they give you like <laughs> one week where you're the right age. Yeah, right. And then, and then you're too old. Yeah, and that week they're bugging you to have kids. And then that week's over and you're too old. <laughs> so, yeah, I think it, I, mean, yeah. I, every, I look in the mirror, I'm like, God, look at what is this? And my husband's like, why do you care? Why do you care? Just, I don't care. That's why I don't turn the lights on in the bathroom. I'm like, no. Yeah. No, I care. I care a little yeah. bit. Oh, okay. So, so I have a ring light. I have a ring light it takes that away okay I definitely need to hook up that ring light I do I I just don't look at the videos too closely when it comes to I try not to talk so much doing well there um <laughs> yeah so the age okay so because what you're saying because the thing with all the millions of people with the new social media and the you know the high school feel of like every it's a popularity contest you've got to like keep ahead of everything you've got to be the it's first exhausting. person to know about everything and it does, it feels exhausting. And, but if you don't think it's a problem, it's not a problem, is it? Like, I don't think age is a problem for me and I've never experienced it as a problem. Never had a problem with getting a book, never thought of it as a problem. But if you start thinking, oh my God, all these groups are opening up and how can I ever, if you start thinking of something as an issue, then it becomes your issue possibly. Yeah, I think that's just a life rule lesson, I guess, to a certain degree. I mean, social media has really, social media has changed everything. Are you, are you good at keeping I, your I, center? Are you good at keeping your center despite social media and no, the ups and the downs? No, I'm awful. No, I hate really? it. I hate it. No, I hate, I, you know, you, I get on, I try not to, I, I, if I really had my druthers, I would quit Facebook. I love Instagram because I love pictures. But I would quit, I would quit Facebook. Um, main, I just think it's not good for the soul. Oh my God, I'm booked until September. <laughs> <laughs> Make everybody else feel like shit. Yeah, there's the I three. Mean, come on. I'm booked until September. Oh my God, I do five finished hours every day now. Oh, and then just, what's it, the it, other it, one? It begs for comparison. And yeah. comparison is, um, is the root of all sort of insecurity. So I, I yeah. hate that. I hate it. And, and I don't, I, I, I can't, you know, this is something I've been thinking a lot about um, in this last week. I'll, I'll be honest with you guys. I have not a lot of work on my plate right now. I have not a lot of work at all. And I'm like, I've been joking. I, Devin's on this call. I see her, she, her studio is next to mine. I've been joking that I'm in forced retirement. Um, that I'm just like playing shuffleboard and, and doing petty point and bacon bread. Um, <laughs> and, and I've been thinking a lot about the nature of being an actor and how every day and every single thing we do is either we either get accolades or we get rejection. We get a book, we're successful. We get turned up, passed over for a book, we're a failure. We get a good review. Oh, look, I'm a successful. We get a bad review or don't get a review. I suck. We get an award. We don't get an award. All day long, it's, we're constantly vacillating between, and, uh, and, and, um, and that's a really hard, that's a really hard place to live, I think. Um, and, and, it, and, it, and, and social media just amplifies that. We know when I started doing audiobooks, there wasn't social media. There were T 
tin cans in the spring <laughs> that long ago. Um, it wasn't it. And so, you know, you did you couldn't compare yourself in that way and, and be made to feel bad. And, but do you um, know the one book thing? Do you know the one? I had a thing, Christmas. It should be banned. I'm sorry. A week when nobody's going to call you and nobody's going to give you anything and you suddenly are staring down the barrel and you're thinking, why didn't I save work? What was I thinking? Finish things. So I had time off. Who needs this time off? You're on like the internet. There's like old women doing eighties aerobics. There's some things yeah, on the internet. Time off is like the death of me. Yeah. And, yeah. but I did something which I haven't done in a really long time. I did a public domain book and I did Ayn Rand mm. Anthem. And it's not a long wow. public domain book. And, you know, I did the cover and I did the book. And the first I was going in there, we're working for free. Nobody's going to look at, but I, I like to do the old, the classic books with like modern covers. I'll tell you what though, I finished that book. I to. was acting, I was enjoying it. I was, and yeah. I'd lost that. Doing all the books for other people, doing the books you get, it becomes a business. And that public domain book, just for me, even if it never sells a single book, it's two hours long, wouldn't make money anyway, but I made it and I'm going to do more of that. I've now yeah, that's got some soul. That's great. Yeah. I mean, I, we all read some shitty, shitty books. Yeah. Um, believe me, I read some shitty books and they're soul crushing sometimes. Absolutely soul crushing. So when you get to do something that really feeds your soul like that it's 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 and you know what if you don't have the ability to say wow that's really good when looking at your own work I'm not sure that you should be an actor you need to be able to recognize when you're in the pocket and you're doing a good job and create um, it if yourself you constantly think oh that's not very good that's not very good that's not very good where is the impetus to keep going but you it, have to but be it able reminds to... you you're your own boss. You created it. It's like actors have to create their own work all the time. Create their own shows, yeah. put things on. If there, if there isn't work, you create work. And it felt good. It was like, I can always be working. There's no reason ever for me not to be working because I can, can make be making money, but we can always be working. But the thing is, I got booked. Things started coming in and I'm suspicious. I'm yeah. really superstitious. I think that the fact, I think that things come to you if you're working. It's like the girl oh, that has a boyfriend, you never everyone look for likes a job. Her. You look for a job when you already have a job. Yeah. Right. You want yeah. something done. You ask the busiest person in the room. I, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I get nothing done when I'm wallowing, but give me a full to-do list and I'm a multitasker. Everyone wants you. So, yeah, so that's my secret. So, except everyone now will know if I start popping up with public domain books on my, <laughs> they'll know. Speaking of public Dr. domain, Gilzer. Great Gatsby. I wish I could do the great, I've been noodling around in my head. How can I make the Great Gatsby be a girl book? What can I do? <laughs> the but, Great Gatsby, I would kill to read that. I don't worry, I'm not auditioning for men's work. And like, I know that's not nice. I wouldn't do that. But Public I mean, it's books. a risk, but, but um, I heard a woman did uh, Treasure Island. I've heard that. So, I mean, it's done, but I don't know. I couldn't, I wouldn't feel comfortable being Nick. Got, it's, I, I don't though. think, because it's a classic. I think you yeah. should do The Great Gatsby is what oh. I'm getting at. <laughs> <laughs> I think you'd be fabulous. Yeah, just do yeah, something just for the fun of it. There aren't, unfortunately, a lot of classics that, are females and I'm not a little woman girl so <laughs> yeah so okay here's me pushing Hillary Huber to do public domain books and you've <laughs> um nice. I, I don't if I don't drum up some more work soon I will well the thing is I've got some questions for you that I've been ignoring because I've been greedily asking my own um so let's okay. ask these um I'm ready I'm in the okay. hot seat Question. Johnny, this is from Melissa. Johnny Heller suggested I listen to one of your books for re research on noir. What book would you recommend for that particular subgenre? On noir? Yeah. Uh, you know, I haven't done a lot of noir, actually. I do a lot of thrillers, um, um, but not noir per se. What's your best um, thriller? 
God, you know, the minute you ask me what book should I listen to, I'm like, have I recorded? And I don't know any books that I've recorded. You know, I'm just looking back here. Um, Okay. I I just did one. There's a new one that just came out that I like a lot called Before She Disappeared. Um, Actually, you know what? I think some of my best thrillers, they're super dark, are the uh, Meg... Gar- Meg Gardner, Meg Gardner books. There's three oh. of them, and they're about serial killers, and they're super dark. Um, I like super dark. Yeah, I was, uh, but yeah, I, I've done like barely any. You know, Unsub was the first one of hers. I'm just looking online, so I would rec. Dark Corners of the Night was the most recent. Unsub, Ends of the Black Nowhere, and Dark Corners of the Night. Meg Gardner is her name. So those are great for um, super dark thrillers. And again, the one I just said, um, Before She Disappeared, which is actually Lisa Gardner. I don't think they're related though. <laughs> but two gardeners writing thrillers. Um, so those are those are good. I, yeah, I don't think I've, I can't really think of any in the noir. I don't know, what makes noir different from thriller anyway? There's a certain sound to it. I always think well, John Keller when that I think sort more. of, you know, mall sounds, hey. But yeah, to me, there's like a chicago we yeah. yeah. Okay, so mm-hmm. Anna Clements wants to know, do you have a book that has stayed with you or changed you in any way? Um, probably. No. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess there, there could be two ways to answer that question. There's did the actual material change me? Like there are a couple of nonfictions that I've read that um, have have really made me vector in on things I never thought about. One on, uh, I, I read the the um, uh, the book that the movie about the brain football, you know, the CET was based on. I can't remember the name of the movie now that, that the football players get. Um, that blew my mind. There, I mean, so I don't know if that's what you're talking about, though. I read one on drums that blew my mind, too. Um, um, but as far as, there's one book that changed me, changed my performance. That's a more interesting answer, I think, the way I perform. Wow. And that's a book called Broken River. Um, and any of you who've, who've studied with me at all, I, I usually, I do a segment on um, point of view. And most every coach does a segment on point of view. But that book was written um, in vastly different multi points of view, uh, third person, multiple points of view, chapter by chapter, it changed. And the writing changed with the character. So when it was from Irina, the 14 year old, 13 year old girl's point of view, the author wrote like a 13 year old girl. Oh my God. Even though it was third person. And then she was like, Oh my God, why are you thinking that way? And ew, that's so icky. And then, and, and it, it was, it was so enlightening to me. I'd never really seen that before. Um, and it, it, it made me really vector in on becoming that character in a way that I would if it were first person, right? Am I making sense? Do you guys follow along? Yeah, because yeah. it was so character written. And right. so what that then did was make me apply that same thinking and methodology to every third person book that I do that has a, a strong point of view, not a multiple point of view throughout the story, but when you can actually feel the shifting POV, it, I've got I, one coming I, I up really like that. Work to infuse that segment with that character's thoughts and feelings. I've got one coming sense. up. I can use that on. Yeah. Oh my God, I so love that, you. That was a real. That was a real eye opener to me. And, I and love actually, that. the one, the book that I listened to a book that gave me the permission to do that, which is the Nick, um, narr- uh, narrated by Malcolm Hill Gardner. And I listened to that prior to getting this Broken River book, and it was the same thing. The author kind of the writing changed with each POC What was that shift. book? The Knicks? And the Knicks, N-I-X. And Malvin Hellgardner went for it. He just, it was huge. His performance was huge. And I, my eyes just went, what? And wow. then I get this next book where I was given the same opportunity. So I hope that answered your question. That, that was a real um, eye-opener That's, for me. I and love that. changed in my career. Okay, yeah. I've got more questions. Um, what percentage of your work has been referral versus direct marketing versus author publisher? 
And that was from Christina. Um, well, I don't do very much direct author work at all. Um, and I have a couple, but those are mostly because they were being published. And then you started off going to publishers, didn't you? You started, started off, off with, straight. Yeah. I mean, I started off with publishers. There yeah. was no ACX. There wasn't anything like that. So Blackstone was my first client and I worked for them exclusively for a couple of years. So it's kind of a, it's not really an applicable question in, yeah. in a lot of ways, only because I've had cemented publisher relationships for a long time. Um, so, but I do market myself to them still. If I, you know, a couple times a year, especially when I feel lull, I go hit all those publishers up. I'm about to do it because I told you I'm in retirement. Um, I hit them all up and say, hey, I've got time in my schedule. You know, I'm here if you need me. You know, I try to make it be about them as much as I can. Um, and I mean, I'd be interested in, in, doing some more author direct route because I think that the pay can be really uh, equitable. Um, but I'm not, I'm not really good at going after things like that. I'm not super good at that. So I don't really know how to do it. I know romance narrators are really good at that and they go to all the romance, um, uh, um, you know, meetings and stuff and conventions and meet authors that way. And I've toyed with going to Thriller Fest that's my, that's my. Are you a thriller story. girl too? That's, what's the no, secret to booking tons of thr What's, what do you think is key to booking a thriller job? Is there a tone? I've asked other people this before as well. Is there a tone? Because they hear a voice and they know it's not a romance. They know it's not. A, somebody told me that sci-fi, they speak faster because people are used to that what do you think the thriller audience is used to like I'm a big fan of Jeff well, Harding that, that's interesting I've never really heard I mean I know that timbre vocal timbre can dictate to a certain degree what right. genre you're going to fall into I mean just let alone the sound of my voice there's a snarkiness in my voice that doesn't really lend itself to romance very well yeah. Um, I have a lot of disdain and you can't really have that. Um, so already I'm sort of geared toward playing badass women who go get the bad guy and I'm, and I'm have the vocal chops to play the bad guy. But as far as booking, you know, you, it's, it's, it's neat to think that we can do, be all things to all people and we can do everything. I think you shoot yourself in the foot a little bit when you try to do that, you know, sure. Could I, go after doing a lot of kids books or go after some romance probably, but it's not my, it's not my strong suit. So, I mean, I'm not really going after anything. I take what they give me, but um, I've just happened to become known for doing thrillers, but to get to really your question, I don't think there is anything different that you do to land any book in any particular genre. You take whatever book you are given and you, you, you become the vessel for those words and for that author's intention, whether it's romance, whether it's sci-fi, whether it's thriller. So, um, I mean, when you said people speak faster in sci-fi, I've never heard that before. That's I heard it from um, someone. I don't know it myself, but I've heard it. From I had someone. no idea. I mean, I speak the same pace when I do sci-fi, but um, I, I don't know. I just, I, I mean, I approach every audition the same, just, what, how can I can convey this in the most direct, intense, connected way possible? I like hearing that. I think Johnny said that as well. I think, yeah, I like, I like hearing that answer. <laughs> I mean, I think that if you want to do particularly thrillers or yeah. you want to do, you know, sci-fi or you have a genre that you are passionate about, then that's what you lead with when you start marketing yourself to, um, to whoever's going to hire you. Those are the samples you, you send them. You is say, the, this is, is where my passion lies. Like? This is what I'm interested in. They don't want you to read a book that you're not interested in. You know, they yeah. don't want you to, because you're not going to give it. I mean, did I not say half an hour ago, I read a lot of books that I hate. 
but I mean, I'll take the work, but you know what I mean? I mean, yeah. they, they want to know that you're passionate about something. So I say lead with that. If you, if you have that opportunity. Is it thrillers that you like the most? Yeah. I love thrillers. Yeah. yeah me too. I like thrillers. I really like, um, girls gone off the rails. Give me any like alcoholic memoir or anything where she dives down and falls apart. I love it. I love that. And the crawl back out again. I love that. Yeah, I, see, I, like, I hate memoirs. I like, hate memoirs. I love memoirs. Really? I love them because I, yeah, I love it because you get to become that person. So you feel the emotions of that. Um, so I, I love, I love that. Um, I do like weirdness yeah, and like edginess. Dark. I like like the freaks like of the world. Anybody that lives on the edge and I love that. Anything that's too gritty and weird. I love yeah. weird. Weird is good. So yeah, we've got great. another question. I have to okay. intersperse my questions with like normal questions. So it seems yeah. like a proper format. Um, Nancy would like to know of the nonfiction you have done, have any, oh, thanks Nancy. That's, this isn't, this is like a, my question. Have any been so ridiculous that you had to pull out every hair to get it done? How did you yes. handle it? Oh my God. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I have one that I read about um, a, a dog psychic. And I, I it just. <laughs> All right. You know what I do when I'm doing something that I just cannot? I, this is my mantra. You could be tarring roofs in Palm Springs in the middle of the summer. And then I'm like, that's like the worst job I can think of. And so this is easy compared to that. I'm not tarring a roof in Palm Springs. In I summer. have a very bad feeling that it's going to end up being a genre because I'm just a subgenre because somebody's just said they had one about a dog psychic too. Really? And oh. then somebody said that they actually read, a, oh no, it's going to become a thing, dog psychics. You have to give yourself a little mental pep talk. Yeah. And you have to say, you know what? This means somebody. This means something to somebody. Before you walk in that booth, you have to say, this means something to somebody. This is going to give somebody a distraction, some useful information, um, some pleasure, uh, something that they can utilize. And so I have to really work hard to check my disdain at the door of my booth. And yeah, go in if, there. It could mean something to the writer, if anybody. Yeah. It could mean and a I lot gotta, to the you writer. Gotta honor what that writer yeah. wrote. They spent a good chunk of their life doing that. So I can laugh and roll my eyes and say, this sucks, but I cannot let that go into the booth with me. That I have to put that away, pack it up, and I can come back out during a break and open it up again and go, Ugh. And I think but the key gotta, there is saying no to what, because that's, that, if, that's, if I'm like, upset about something and I can't you. be honest or respect it, I'm not going to do it. I've got to say no. No, no, no. Yeah, that's, to, that's totally different being when you, um, I mean, I have a bar. It's a pretty low bar, um, <laughs> but I do have a bar. And, um, and so there, there are no-go items that I just refuse to do, but that's not based on, that's based on my political standing, my moral, such as it is, um, beliefs. Um, uh, the one, I think there's one that I <clears throat> can think of off the top of my head that I turned down. It was a book about a woman who uh, prayed her gay away. And yeah. I was like, I can't, I, that's, I can't, I can't do that. And, and let me just, I'll just tell you this. If you ever, this comes up a lot, you know, is it if I turn the book down because I'm not comfortable with the language or with the amount of sexual content or politically, you know, if I turn it down, will they never hire me again? No. If anything, I think they will respect you that much more yeah. for saying this isn't for me. Thank you very much. I appreciate the offer. I appreciate it. But um, I won't be able to do this book justice because uh, I don't believe in in what they're saying. So never be afraid to turn something down because uh, you find it morally repugnant. Because what's Everybody the point of being your that. own boss if you're not going to look after your own career? You're your agent. I mean, that's Somebody... really, it's hard as a yeah. freelancer, as an, an actor to say no to work. It's really yeah. hard to do that. It's especially when work is few and far between. It's super hard. 
but yeah, you can't, you can't live with something that really makes your stomach crawl. Did you find starting this job, you know how you said, oh, my bar, jokingly, my bar is kind of low and everything. Mm -hmm. I was shocked at what I would do and what I wouldn't do. Totally not what I would have expected. Like I've done books that like, you know, space, gender, swap, whatever under my pseudonym. And, but like, if you hurt an animal, I don't want to know you. Yeah. <laughs> do you know what I mean? It certainly it's, makes it's, you realize where you're, yeah, what you're willing to do. Wow. Yeah. And I would never have thought that. Probably that, that changes too, I bet. I think, I don't know, probably changes sometimes a little bit. You know, oh, yes. one of my first um, hires outside of Blackstone was um, Stefan Rudnicki. Do you guys know him? Skyboat. Um, he, he asked me if I would read some short stories. He used to do this compilation of America's Best Erotica uh, by Susie Bright, who's a big erotica um, uh, writer and editor, sort of. And would I be willing to do some erotica stories? And I was like, yeah, okay, I think I can do erotica. I, <laughs> I've done like five books or something. Sure, I can do some erotica that, you know, hurts her wrist and, oh, there's a leg and there's maybe a heaving bosom <laughs> or two. And... <laughs> And I got these three stories, and you guys, they were like fisting, strap-on, I mean, robot sex. And I was like, oh, my God. I was so flipped out by it. I'm like, this is erotica? What's triple X if this is erotica? I, and, and I was so nervous because I had to go, you know, to his studio and record them. I'm like, I have to do these in front of him? This is so embarrassing. And I was, I was so grateful because his, you couldn't see him from the booth the door wasn't glass and I was so grateful for that be careful and there are a lot of scams out there now people putting books out for auditions on ACX and they're not the writer or the rights holder yeah I've, heard I've never that. heard of that either unconscionable we, yeah we have to I think I think <clears throat> the more things are evolving the more we have to be on top of it and always watching everything and because as an actor, you just show up and do the audition. Well, you're psyched. You're like, yeah, I want to work. Uh -huh, I'll do it. Sure. Yeah. Where, do you, where, where do you want me? Yeah. I mean, it's the nature of what we do. We're just like. But you're right. You have to. I remember a, an acting job went all the way to Birmingham. A guy and I, and we had to do a speech in front of like a set for, I won't say the name again, a massive company, right? Phone company. And they called us the next, the first day. This was like seven years ago. I was young. I swear I was. And they called us up and they said, the client doesn't want you doing the scene anymore. They're going to put you behind scenes as the voice of God because they, nobody wants to see people your age in the same room as a bed. <laughs> Talk about sexism. Wait, you just reminded me of another funny job. This is so not germane, but it's a funny story. Um, really early on in my commercial voiceover career, I got hired to do um, some promos for a like Playboy, um, like satellite trans dial in to transponder 599 girls all the time. Huh? It was some kind of, I don't even know what that is. Um, Party and, lines and or something. I was like, okay. And I, I show up, I'm like, you know, hot girls and you can get what you want. Dial in to transfer this and play, but it's hot. It's, this it's that and uh, you know I finish you feel like a little dirty you know and, and you're, you think you've done your job and the, and the producer said hey you know it'd be really cool what if we got her to like underneath the money words to, to do them like hi so I had to go back into the booth and say those words like that and, oh my god I walked out I'm like can I have a shower now please and then my hundred dollars like a scalding shower like it's like you're oh. not a human being and you get oh, used to god. that because they do that to actors and actresses all the time and I think that that comes to the question that I started off the call with it's who everything ties together it's what we said about you saying oh i'm you know forcibly retired and in and i said do you have a core of who you are and are you because i'm easily sidetracked with socializing i tend to socialize too much and that's it i forget like my own name like was i was supposed to do a book and um i think that's what it comes down to is and turning down books 
us having the guts to not be a freelancer, but to be a business owner, right? Like, I'm in yeah. charge. I'm strong. It's different hats. We have to wear so many different hats. And I'm not good at the business ones, really. But, you know, now I'm a director. Now I'm an editor. Now I'm a marketer. Now I'm a account person. Now I'm HR, you know, telling myself to take breaks or whatever. I, it's, it's really hard. It's really hard. And I, yeah. I'm not, there's a lot of parts of it that I'm really not good at. But like marketing, I hate it. I hate I hate marketing. I hate posting anything reviewee oriented. I, I hate it. Um, I'll do it every now and then, but super reluctantly. Um, I'm really good at, at like promotion versus marketing. And I think there's like self promotion. I'm really good in a crowd talking. What, that's what I call sort of like self promotion that I'm great at, which is why I love all the events. I'm great in person, but ask me to market stuff and it's, ugh. You've it got an energy. Cringe. Have you, do you, do you feel that you've got an energy and come to think of it? That's what I got from that coaching session. You have an energy, like a massive energy and you like share yeah, it. I, I do. I have a big, I have a big, I have a big, I know that I have a big and cheek or whatever. You give it, it, you give I, it like with no, it's like here. Take some. I know. That's a problem. It's a bit of a problem because you're going to get it whether you want it or not. And, and you know what? A lot of people hate me when they first meet me because my energy is really strong. And, um, and if I meet somebody who has that, a, a, a similarly strong energy, there can be a big magnetic kind of force. Push. And then oftentimes the once we get past that, we'll end up being some of my best friends started out that way kind of. But no, I, I know that I have a big energy and uh, I believe me, I, like I said, a lot of people don't like it. So, but it's what it is. It doesn't matter. You can't make yourself smaller in the room because, but do you ever get, do you ever feel that you use it up and that you don't replenish fast enough or do you always just no, feel it's a bottomless pit? <laughs> wow. It's a bottomless pit. That's brilliant. I think that's brilliant. I think it's fueled but by I, positivity. I, mean, I, do of, I do a lot, you know, um, there's, just this is this theory my sister-in-law told me she said you know there are people who recharge by being around other people yeah and there are people who recharge by being by themselves um and i'm a little bit of both I was, i'm an only child and so i'm super good by myself and i need my time a lot but i also thrive on that other energy i need the energy of other people to sort of boost me up a little bit. And then maybe that, maybe that's the answer. That's the recovery time is just doing little things by myself. But. So what have you taught? So in the time that you've been an audiobook narrator, whether it's to do with the job or productivity or the way you feel about yourself or your work, what, you know how like you never one day realize something. It's like you look back and you think, Oh, I wish I'd known that. What do you think that you've, like Hillary now, how is she different from Hillary when she very first started? Mm hmm. I mean, God, we're all supposed to grow, aren't we? I don't know. Or you can become more, uh, you can become more, you don't have to grow. I mean, I'm finally learning that I don't want to do things I don't want to do anymore. I'm sick of it. I spent too many years kissing up to people and doing things I don't want to do. And I don't want to do it anymore. That's yeah, not okay. growing. I, <laughs> right. It's no, it's just being set up. That's called getting older is what that yeah. is. I realize, yeah. Um, I, I, I think that one thing that's changed is I've let some of the fear go away and I'm, I've started to ask for what I think I deserve. I mean, I, I, I've been doing this for 15 years. And do you know that I've never, ever asked for a rate increase from any of my publishers? And I did this December, and I asked for a big one for all, mm -hmm. all out, out of all, of all of them. And what because did they say? It's about scared. time. Every every single one said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, you deserve that." Um, but that I was I was really scared to do that. 
And, but notice, remember, I'm retired, so <laughs> maybe they're not hiring me anymore. I, I'm trying to or figure that out. Or maybe um, it's right after Christmas and all the new books coming out are like ancient new romances and, you know. But what occurred to me is that if I don't value my experience, then yeah. why should they value my experience and my professionalism and, um, and, and the 600 books that I've recorded, you know? So that, that I was scared shitless. I didn't, I sent out each email. I wrote one a day and labored over it and sent it just because I needed to get it in little, you know, I, cu I couldn't do it all at once because I couldn't handle the rejection all at once um, if, it, if it came to that. So that, that's probably the biggest change is valuing, valuing what, that this is what, who I am and what my reputation is and what the breadth of my work is. Um, and realizing that if I'm going to be valued, I, I need to value myself first. Um, and I, yeah, I wish I'd learned that. I wish I'd learned that earlier. I, I, I mean, there are a lot of people I know who, I, students who probably have asked for higher rates than I was getting because they already knew that and I didn't. So, I love yeah, that. that's hard. Love that's that. hard to value yourself, you know. But do you feel good about it? I've, I'll feel really, I'll feel better about it when I get some more work. Yeah. <laughs> no, I feel, I do. I feel good about it. You know, I'll tell you, there was another, another thought behind it, which is also, if I want A-list titles, I need to be seen as an A-list narrator. And an A-list narrator is not making, you know. Do you know what you've just said? You've just, okay. My theory, Hillary, check back with me in two months. My theory is, and you guys, do I not always say this? Anytime you go through a dry spell, it's right before a step up. Always. When it's a true dry spell where you have that moment of niggling, what am I doing here? It is right before you either change significantly, have like a realization you change your game, or something changes in your career. I swear to you. And every time I've ever said it on a call, like two weeks later, a month later, somebody has posted, oh my God, it came true. All right. So two months lips to, from my lips, I swear. That's the beginning of something different. Any true dry Here. spell is always the beginning of something different. I mean, I go through dry spells probably twice a year and my husband like rolls. I can hear his eyeballs rolling from across the room. He's like, you think you always think you're never going to work again. They found out. They found out. You know, the imposter syndrome. And I bet you're going to get some amazing book. <sighs> you're going to get, like, get some book that's like, yeah. Yeah. Some earth shattering. Wouldn't that be? I'm ready. Wouldn't that be Bring it on. amazing doing a book that's like, change the world book you've already done one of those i read i don't want to bring it up because it's like a politics book and that can open a can of worms but i'll bring it up i listened to that very book. stable genius yeah that one i just that... did i just did uh i just did three more chapters um, really for christmas yeah because some other crap happened like he lost the election <laughs> so yeah. they added they added some more chapters that um, was some book that was some book. I was glued listening to that thing. I think I listened to it twice. I am a little obsessed with the news where I was at the time. But yeah, wow. Big, big books. That was a good one. Yeah. I mean, if you like, you, I'll, I'll tell you guys something interesting about that book. Um, uh, you know, it was an insider, total left wing, reporting on what was going on in the White House. And so I'm not a big fan of reading Audible reviews just because they're like, Ooh. Um, but I wanted to see what was said about that book. And within 24 hours, there were a slew of reviews, all absolutely eviscerating me. This is the worst narrator I've ever read. This is like Siri read this book. This is robotic. This sucks. Why would anybody ever hire her? And I was like, what? I fully expected the book to get ripped apart because it's so left-wing liberal, but nobody was talking about the book. They were all talking about me. And I spoke to somebody at, at Penguin Random House in the marketing department. I was like, I'm gutted by this. I can't even believe this. She said, oh, honey, those are um, all, that's all trolling. They're not going to go after the book because 
nobody's going to read that book who doesn't espouse those political views. Yeah. So there's no point in going after the book. They're going to go after whatever they can to dissuade people from to listening to that book. book. So they're going to go after you. And so I thought that was interesting. And I, whether it's true or not, I'll take it. But the thing is, because how many people can listen to a book that length within 24 hours? Well, that's the other thing, that quickly, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, I have one. I get. I don't. I don't listen to my reviews. I have somebody that listens to them once a month, and I listen to theirs. And if there is anything we have to know about, you know, like if we suddenly get a lisp, we don't realize. We tell each other. And I have been told on good authority that I do have one reviewer that loves me so much within about 20 minutes of every book release, they leave a mean review. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, that's why I don't read them. I don't see them. It can't hurt me. You know what I mean? Cause yeah, the audible you, how much can you take in? Good. You know, yeah, if I need to know good. something, I need, I'm happy if my writers are happy or if the publishers are happy, I'm especially happy if the publishers are happy. Yeah. And for, you guys, I'm not sure the publishers are really taking the time to read audible reviews. I mean, yeah. maybe some are, but I don't even know if they read audio file reviews that religiously. I don't know. And also you have to move on, don't you? You you should be looking your next is what Sean said. You should be looking for your next job. Yeah, yeah, not focusing on what's already done. Only if, you know, if sometimes there may be something a little instructive in there, but constructive, but I, I don't know. That's see, that's why I have Morning. somebody check it out for me just yeah. in case. But yeah. you know. Um okay, so it was wonderful talking to you i can i you're what we were talking about the energy you share you actually were completely the reason i got out of a slump at one point and you 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 instill confidence in people and i i just think that's i think that's the biggest gift you can give people especially freelancers like us because we're all in the same boat and you give to us so much i mean so much just no, your energy you. you know well i just i love what we do i um everybody has something to offer so i'm just like tickled that this many faces showed up um it's fun to see you all i'm sick of being by myself <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait till oh. we can all hang out together uh, you're always welcome on any of the Joe calls. <laughs> um, yeah. Also, do you have any final words of wisdom or a last sentence or something to leave with the YouTube audience that will be watching this in 30, 40, 50, 60 years? <laughs> <laughs> you got to prep me for that one. Um, no, you know what? Just have fun. Yeah. You know what my favorite quote is from the movie Arthur? Isn't fun the best thing to have? Just have fun. Don't take it all so seriously. These are books. Yeah. Find the joy. Yeah. There you go. Isn't fun it's, the best thing to have? That's it sounds simple, but it's hard to, it's easy to forget that. It just is. Yeah. Yay. Thank you, Hillary. Oh, wow. You Thank are you. a bench. Thanks. Thanks every single one of you. I'm looking at you all. Yes, thank you right for joining now. you guys. And Hillary, you're yeah. welcome back anytime. It's been thank you. Welcome pleasure. back anytime. Isn't she amazing? I'd be delighted. Guys? I told you. Did I tell you? I told you. Hillary Huber, guys. <laughs> Talk to you later. Just Bye. like you. She's just. We're all the same. Bye, guys. Okay. Bye, everybody. Have a great day. Bye. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.